Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, uh, chapter 45, the verse, first 15 verses, page 37 in your pew Bible. First book of the Bible, Genesis, is a, what, 50 some chapters long, and the story of Joseph, the Joseph narrative, the Joseph saga, takes 15 of those chapters. So in the, the, the story of Israel, the saga, the narrative of Joseph is very formative, very important. You may know the story of how Joseph, the 11th of 12 brothers, his father was Jacob, how Joseph was a little arrogant and a lot irritating and told stories about himself that uh, uh, made his brothers cringe and they responded violently. First they threw him into a cistern and then they sold him into slavery to a caravan heading south from Judah to Egypt. Remarkably, providentially, Joseph rises in power through many dangers, toils, and snares to become second in power in the empire of Egypt. And having been warned in a dream about a coming famine, develops a plan, a plan to save food during the seven good years for the seven coming bad years, a plan that will feed both Egypt and the surrounding nations. The famine hits, and Joseph's brothers in Egypt are, and in Judah are forced to come to Egypt to seek aid. And they don't immediately recognize Joseph. In fact, they are sent away with some food. And the story is complicated. But after an extended period of time and two trips of the brothers from Judah to Egypt and back, Joseph can no longer contain his secret. He can, in a way, no longer stay in the closet about who he is. And he reveals himself to his brothers. That's where the, the story will read this morning. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. He's a powerful man, and he demands a private conference with his brothers. So no one stayed with them when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. I, I couldn't believe it. The one that they had sold into slavery was now in power in Egypt. He was alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with you, yourselves because you sold me here, for, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the, ham, the famine in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be nothing, neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord, oh, all, and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to, your, to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, and you, you and your children, and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. 
Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin. Benjamin is the youngest brother's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Let's pray together. God, for this Sunday, for the prayers of this Sunday, the songs of this Sunday, the scripture of this Sunday, the word of this Sunday, may your love be known and may the beloved community increase. Amen. It had been a long, hard journey. Sold into slavery, having endured a precarious rise to power in the Egyptian court, and now confronted with the knowledge that he was saving the very brothers who had sought to destroy him, Joseph cried out to them, I am your brother, and fell into weeping. For the brothers, it had also been a long, hard journey. They lived with the knowledge of how they had abused their brother and mistreated their father. More than once, they had made the journey from their homeland to Egypt. More than once, they had, they had endured the scrutiny that comes with being an outsider seeking aid. And now the Egyptian in charge of foreign assistance called them into a private room and instead of charging them as spies, identified himself as their brother. They feared what vengeance was next. I am your brother. This poignant, memorable, heart-rending scene from the book of Genesis teaches us clearly how importantly, important it is to be able to honestly name who we are and who we love. It reveals that it is the greatest of gifts to be able to say without constraint, I love you. To say those words clearly, freely, joyfully, it makes it clear that it can be life-saving to step out of the closet and speak freely of who we love. I am your brother. We are defined by who we love. Who was Joseph without his brothers? Who were they without him? Who are we without the relationships that shape us and define us. For a brief moment, let's look at one of the most well-known stories of the Bible, Peter's denial of Jesus through this lens. Jesus had been arrested and was enduring the mockery of a trial and would soon be crucified. As his followers waited outside around a fire, someone said to Peter, I know you. You're the chief assistant of that guy they just arrested. Peter denied any connection to, any relationship with, or any love for Jesus. It happened a second time and a third. When the weight of what he had done hit him, Peter was broken. His relationship to Jesus was the very core of his life. Yet when given a chance to declare it, Peter lied. Peter had sacrificed everything to follow Jesus. Yet when it mattered most, he tried to keep it hidden. Who can live like that? Peter's denial hurt him, it hurt Jesus, and it undermined the community. When we cannot or do not speak freely of who we love, whether it's Joseph, or Jesus, or now, pain rules. 
However, in many cultures, communities, churches, GLBTQ persons are told, we like you, but we don't want to know who you love. Can you just be quiet about that part of your life? We don't need to know about your private life. Yet the truth is unassailable. We are defined by who we love. When permission is not given to speak openly, honestly, joyfully in this regard, pain rules. Take this reality a step further. There are communities, congregations, and families in which love is not only silenced, but assaulted. GLBTQ persons are told that if they would get their relationship with God right, their unnatural desires would go away, and some, some desperately try to, you've heard the phrase, pray the gay away. Some do themselves physical harm, even taking their own lives. Some are subjected to what's called conversion therapy, a medical practice outlawed, outlawed in California, but which is still prevalent in religious circles. In such therapy, the goal, through talk or electric shock and other methods, is to convince gay, lesbian, transgender people that they are heterosexual. A recent NPR report estimates that conversion therapy has affected the lives of nearly 700,000 people in the United States with disastrous results. In a Good Faith Media article, Zach Dawes Jr. notes that a study released in 2020 found that 7% of people in the United States have experienced conversion therapy with religious leaders carrying out 81% of the reported instances of such therapy. The findings revealed that individuals who had undergone conversion or reparative therapy were far more likely to contemplate, plan, and attempt suicide than those who did not encounter such therapies. Because we are defined by who we love. Joseph needed to say, I am your brother to his brothers. Jesus needed to hear, I am with you, from Peter and the community needed to hear that. Because we are defined by who we love, we need Pride Sunday. We need to be able to name our love honestly. Joseph needed to say, I am your brother. His brothers needed to hear it. Peter was broken when he could not find a way to say, I am with Jesus. What that would have meant to the community. Human beings need, especially in their families, their workplaces, and their faith communities, to be able to define who they love and the ways in which that love defines them. Such honesty brings life to their souls and grace to the community. Take a moment. Think with me about who you love. The ways in which that love defines you. Your spouse? Could be parents? Friends, sisters, just think about who you love and the way that love defines you. For many years I've said, my argument is simple. I just went, I want all to be able to wear a ring freely the way I wear a white ring freely. For this ring defines me. You can't really know me or understand me without this ring. Think with me about who you love, the ways in which that love defines you. Is it not essential to your mental, 
physical, spiritual well-being to speak honestly of that love. We are defined by who we love. Let's speak our truth, name our joy, and open the door for the grace that follows truth and honesty and embrace. Amen. Amen.